perfect. Okay. So we're recording and just wanted to start with a quick introduction of what we're doing here today. I thought it'd be helpful for me to give you guys a tutorial on like the typical um, public art and design process and then see how you want to do your process in Superior. So um, just real basic intro is there's a typical process, a standard process that we administrators who do public art and design projects use. And if you guys want to use that process, that's kind of what I'm showing you today. And then we really need to define the roles and responsibilities of um, the subcommittee, the subcommittee chairs, and then me, staff. So there's a variety of things that we could do. And one of my coworkers said something today that really resonated with me. We're building the ship while we're sailing on it. <laughs> so we're developing this process at the same time as we're trying to use it. And so it's been a little bumpy, just like, you know, waves are in the ocean. Um, so we have part of our ship built right now with the public art and design handbook that you approved a couple sections of last week. We have part of our ship built with the creative placemaking master plan and a budget that the town has identified. But we've not done a full selection process together yet. So that's kind of the missing part of this is um, we have the trailhead committee starting, the temporary art committee has started. We've got all these committees that are ready to get going, but we haven't really figured out what our process is yet. Me being a new staff person, relatively new, just the last year, almost and a half. And then um, CAPS has a new committee as well. You guys are only a couple, three years old as well. And you've only done one art selection process. And that was um, with a roundabout sculpture. There was a variety of things I've heard that went well and went wrong. And so um, one of the reasons I was hired was to help you through these processes because there's no reason that you need to go through life um, uh, muddling through trying to figure out how to do this when I've, I've done hundreds and hundreds of projects like this. So I'm here to help you accomplish your goals and in whatever capacity you all want me to. So with that being said, I made a couple PowerPoint slides that I wanted to show that will explain, like I said, a typical art and design selection process. So um, with that being said, are there any questions or thoughts or other agenda things that anyone wants to get through today um, regarding this kind of process? I don't think so. Well, I don't. So, and Melinda might, I don't know, okay. Melinda might when she jumps on. Um, yeah, and something might come up as we're talking. So feel free at any point to say, hey, well, what about this? Or, hey, what about that? Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Where is it? Share. Okay, so I made the I made three slides to show you. And the first slide really is just to show you kind of the um, what what we need to really keep in mind as we are doing huh, let me do this in full mode. Okay. What we need to keep in mind as we're working here together is we have to follow the town's purchasing policy. And so I am going to have to be at times the policeman to make sure that the policy is being enforced. I don't want to have to do that, but that's going to be part of my job. So right here, um, I just wanted to capture um, the, a quote from the purchasing policy. So you know that um, when goods and services are being purchased on behalf of the town, which is what you guys are doing when you're procuring art and design projects. Um, the most efficient use of tax, we have to follow, we have to try to do the most efficient use of tax dollars 
provide for timely purchases and follow common sense and good business practices. So we have, you know, just kind of a standard policy that I have to follow and I will guide you guys through that. The basics of that policy are anything that we purchase, whether it's a good or service over $2,000 has to have a competitive bid. So that's pretty much everything we do. The prairie dogs is not that. The um, bus shelters are just barely that. Um, if, um, so, but everything else is, is gonna be over $2,000. So we have to have at least three um, proposals for every project. Wait, that's so, like the basic level of policy there. Okay, so the $2,000, the prairie dogs all together was what, 18,500, something like that? Yes, but it is a contract per contractor. Okay. And so each, because we're okay. paying each one is $700, we don't have to have a competitive bid for the prairie dogs. We can go and just pick artists. Hey, okay. we want to invite you to create a prairie dog for $700. Give us a design, you know, so we don't have to compete that project as a requirement. Now you guys may want to, like Debbie said earlier, you might have heard her say, oh, I sure hope we have 20 things to choose from, 20 proposals to choose from, because that would be great, right? To pick 12 out of 20 instead of like having exactly 12 and not really being happy with all 12. So that's just one example. Any other questions about kind of just the basic purchasing policy of three bids or quotes? Okay. So then the next thing is, this is our um, public art management handbook page five, and I am a very visual person, so I decided to turn this into a visual graphic. This is exactly what the handbook says in page five. So these are our steps to the process that you guys approved last week. The budget has to be identified, and we do that through our annual budgeting process and our creative placemaking master plan. So we don't start any projects unless there's a budget. Good thing we have all this right here. We're set to go. We've already finalized this process. <laughs> the next step is that CAPS establishes project criteria. That includes picking the site. So for example, it will be um, an underpass. Now, when you're talking about a site, it also means the placement within the site. So you might pick an underpass and you might then decide, okay, we're gonna do the pathway in the underpass, or we're gonna do the walls in the underpass. So there's the overall site and then the, what goes on within the site. You wanna pick what type of art it's going to be. Is it gonna be metal? Is it gonna be fiberglass? Is it gonna be a mural? Is it gonna be a sculpture? So it literally is what is the type of art or design? And when I say art, I also mean design. Since we decided to call this public art and design, it's just interchangeable. You guys need to decide if there's gonna be a theme for any project. If it's gonna be a historic theme, great. If it's gonna be a theme that just is art for art's sake, it's up to you. And then eligibility means who is eligible to apply for the project. And then the selection method means, um, we're gonna go over that in just a moment, but basically it's the open competition, the invitational competition. So we'll go over those details in a minute. So CAP sets the criteria. Now, in the case of the trailhead, CAPS has decided to let the subcommittee develop this criteria. So that's when we go to the subcommittee level. So subcommittee is convened, and in the trailhead committee, the subcommittee is going to decide all these things. In the handbook, it literally says CAPS decides all this stuff, and then the subcommittee does these two bullet points narrows down the applications, and invites semifinalists to make proposals. Now in the trailhead committee, the trailhead's gonna do these bullet points and these bullet points. And then the next level is CAPS reviews proposals. 
So the subcommittee picks artists to complete proposals and then CAPS reviews all the proposals. And then CAPS will select the finalist. That is the person, if it's one project, that is the person who is going to design and fabricate whatever this thing is we're getting. If it's over, if it's equal to or over $25,000, it has to go to the board for review. So you guys may have already like memorized all this stuff because we, you approved it last week at the meeting. Was that only a week ago? Is my, my timeline right? Okay. So I know what have a we question. haven't. Yeah. Okay. So the budget identified, like on the trailhead, we know the budget is 25,000. So it's 30. Is it 30? That one is 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the trailhead is 30,000, um, step one, budget identified is already done. Right? Yep. Okay. Was that all? That was it. Okay. That was easy. Well, just if you know what we haven't. Go ahead. Well, so, so we know the trail has 30,000. Um, we had some leeway with the, with the temporary art. Um, and then when we're doing those, all those have pretty, pretty definite budgets on them. Correct. That have yeah, were identified so the master last plan, year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The master plan has identified exactly the budget for each project. Um, with some loosey goosey budgeting happening in two to three years, because um, this year was real concrete because we knew what we could do this year. Next year was a little bit more loose. And then the following years, th years three, four, and five in the master plan are pretty loose in um, what um, the exact budgets are for each project. So in our case, we're doing a um, collaboration with OSAC. So what will that look like for selecting the finalist? Um, I'm wondering if we need to take that to both committees. No, in, in your public art handbook, so this right here, there is another page that describes um, the approval process. And there are no other committees in the approval process for public art and design. Okay. Now it's where you want to be collaborative and helpful and have partners where you might say, okay, let's take this proposal to OSAC and get their input. Now you may not want to ask them to vote on it, but you might want their input. Okay. So that subcommittee for the trailhead, for example, um, they narrow down the applications and invite the semifinalists to make proposals, but that subcommittee then they really don't, they don't vote on anything. What do they do? Just like give a verbal perspective or how does that work when you're working with OSAC on that, for instance? Well, so the OSAC members on the subcommittee will have each have one vote, just like the CAPS committee members. So everyone on a subcommittee gets one vote. Usually, um, and if I'm the facilitator, I try to bring people to a consensus rather than having to raise their hands to vote. But if it seems like people are not really like gelling and half the room likes one artist and the other half likes the other artist, then I do scoring and voting. And so that's where my background comes in handy is if we need to start doing scoring and voting, um, then, then I have it, you know, have it covered. But I, I really try to facilitate to bring the group to consensus because that sometimes is the best positive outcome for everybody rather than raising your hand and having half the group vote this way and half the group vote that way. It just causes all kinds of um, trouble in the end, but. So on, I on, might the have trailhead, so on the trailhead committee, Claire, how many members are there? There are what three OSAC and how many caps? I, um, I think there might be four and four actually. But doesn't have, caps have to be a majority that's a that's actually a good question because they i, I want to say there were four people that um that from osac that wanted to be a part of it ah uh, and had i known that i would have suggested we need to add another person because we don't do even we don't do even committee 
Yeah, that's a good point. So Sean, Tracy, yeah. um, let me look back at the email just to make sure. And, and, okay. Rainier. Rainier. So I'm not so on. looking at that. Go ahead. No, since I'm not on the subcommittee for that, but do, do I need to pull in so we make sure that we have five caps and, and three OSAC? Oh, you know what? Never mind. There's only three people. Rainer, Sean, and Tracy, I believe. Yeah. So never mind. So we've got three, okay. three from okay. there and four from us. Great. Perfect. See, I recommend um, subcommittees be between seven and nine. Anything more than nine is really hard to handle. And odd. It always needs to be odd because I have had even numbers before and split votes and it's one of the worst experiences. So, um, so what I really wanted to get at with this slide is that you guys have a process, right? We have this set up where CAPSA does this, the subcommittee does this, CAPS does this, and the board of directors does this, the board of trustees. But what we don't have set up is the next slide. So we haven't established who does what, what you want my help with, and what happens at these subcommittee meetings. So that's the next slide. And that's where I think this tutorial is helpful because we haven't had a chance yet to go into these deep, deep details. And I know Claire's been frustrated with trying to figure out what to do with the trailhead, but it's a, it's a group decision on what happens next. And um, that's why I haven't been able to give Claire a very clear direction on what to do at this first subcommittee meeting because we have not established it yet. Again, another situation of, we're, we're, we're riding in this boat, but we're also trying to build it at the same time. So this next slide, let me go to it if I can. There, whoop, here it is. This is a typical um, art and design selection process. It's kind of an industry standard. Um, we do not have to use it. I just wanted to explain to you what happens at um, the next few meetings. This is pretty much the to-do list. So you guys need to decide how much you want me to help with and how much you want to do on your own. Um, typically, a municipality will have an administrator in my role that facilitates the meetings. And what that means is um, the staff person makes sure the decisions that need to be made at that meeting are made, number one, and that everybody in the room has the opportunity to talk. And then, as I mentioned earlier, consensus building is really our specialty, to make sure that everyone feels like their voice was heard, that there aren't any arguments, that if there's any problem solving that needs to happen, because everyone has their own opinion, and art and design is very charged when you're going to be putting it in someone's neighborhood. Um, so we have this process that, that we, tip, we typically follow. And again, I don't want to shove any of this down your throats. This is just um, suggestions and food for thought. So, so at the first on, meeting. We're only on roles and responsibilities that the first bullet there. Right. Okay. So generally, this are, these bullet points indicate the agenda item for a typical first meeting. So the first meeting is always for planning. It's to figure out all the criteria for the project. So roles and responsibilities would typically be something you discuss with the group. So I've made some links here just to show you. Hopefully this, these links will work. Oh, you know what? They don't work in this. Um, setting. Hold on one minute. Let me just pull that up. So this is just an example of roles and responsibilities handout that I have given in the past. I use this in Lakewood. The handout um, describes what the art selection panel, in Lakewood's case, they call it an art selection panel. This is what the art selection panel's responsibility is. And so we would go over what the group is meant, like what their role is at the meeting. 
Then we would go over what the approval process is. Then we go over what the voting rules are. Every member gets one vote. Confidentiality. I always make sure people feel um, confident that they can say whatever they want, that I'm not going to go spread it around town as a rumor, you know, that, that what we talk about in these meetings is confidential. They are open to the public, but I'm not going to go do a press release and say someone doesn't like something or, or some whatever. It's, it's confidential. We want everyone to feel comfortable to say what they want. Um, we always go through a conflict of interest um, so that they know um, deep, without getting into too much detail just um, how to vote and not be a conflict of interest vote. And then we always tell people they're not compensated because they're volunteers. Sometimes people don't understand that when they are sitting on a committee, you have to spell it out. And then we talk about communication between meetings. So this is just a typical handout that I would give to a committee to describe who does what for each, um, for, for the project. Can you, um, I, send, that, can you yeah. send that to us another way? Is there a way for you to send that document to us? Oh, sure. Yeah, that was the one I used in the past for Lakewood. I have lots of examples. Um, I have one for Commerce City. I have one for Lakewood. I have one for Aurora. I mean, I've, I've worked in over two dozen cities around. So they all vary depending on what the city needs and is interested in. So I can definitely put in the Dropbox all of these samples that I have. Okay. Now, on the, on the subcommittee with the roles and responsibilities, um, Originally, conceptually, the idea of the subcommittees rather than the whole CAPS committee doing this was to save time and allow people to choose maybe the project they wanted to be on and how much they wanted to be involved in it. But in that subcommittee world, it still seems like, for instance, on the main event. Of course, that's not really art. So let's, let's use the trailhead. It seems that if you have a subcommittee trailhead chair, then the chair would be um, developing and guiding the agenda and you know doing those things like just because that is the kind of the appointed person representing the committee in the town, that that subcommittee chair would kind of guide through all those agenda items. And then the staff liaison, I mean, or staff person, you, would then um, help the chair kind of decide what to do, where to go. This is what we need to do next. Um, do you see what I mean? Rather than like, and even in, in our CAPS meetings, that the chair is the one with your help, puts together the agenda, leads the meeting, ask for the votes and that kind of stuff. Is that kind of what happens here? I'm, I'm a little confused again. Well, do we decide that like next let's, week? Um, no, I think we need to decide that today. And so what, um, let me answer your question in two ways. First, um, I have never had an art selection committee that had a chair. So what we're doing together again is building the boat while we're trying to ride on it. You know, I've, I've not done this before. So we're doing this together. And I'm here to do any part of this process you guys want me to. If you all decide the chair should run the meeting and the selection process, that's, uh, that's up to you. I, I am here if you want me to be the full facilitator, I can do that. If you guys want me to let you do the meetings on your own and you just come to me and say, these are the, these are the three artists that we want to do proposals. And I have not participated at all in these meetings. That's fine with me too. So I can be as hands on or hands off as you want. What I thought I would show you here is what a typical um, meetings would entail. Okay. And then you can decide if you want the chair of each subcommittee to be responsible for these things, or if you want me to be responsible for these items. I mean, and I so, would... um, <clears throat> go ahead. 
Um, I feel comfortable running the meeting and doing all those things. Not everybody might feel comfortable. So it might be a case by case basis. You might have some people who'd prefer you to run the meeting and to go through all those things. Um, I run meetings all the time, so I feel pretty confident about that. So two things regarding that. First, let's go through all these things so you know what they are before you volunteer yourself because you may not want to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing about it is you all also need to decide if you want each subcommittee for each project to decide what Claire just suggested. Are you guys going to set a precedence that all subcommittees, the chair does these things, or do you want to pick and choose and not have consistency where the chair may um, run it or they may not run it? It would be up to the chair. So those are a couple things you need to decide. Do you want consistency among all projects, or do you want each project to have its own um, process. An interesting so question. So with that being because, said. My intention was never to make it really complicated with a lot of work. It was really if you have a subcommittee that's working on something that they're really interested in, it actually makes it easier and more streamlined. Um, it almost sounds like we're making it a little bit more complicated. Should it, should it have not gone on the subcommittee route? Um, and the whole CAPS committee together? Well, let's go through these two, um, these two typical meeting structures, and you guys can decide okay. what you want your meetings to be like. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, the first agenda item would be the roles and responsibilities. Um, you just, we already went through that. The approval process, we always tell the committee members who's really ultimately deciding. And we all already know who that is. <laughs> it's the board. So, um, but the, we need to describe that for people like OSAC, who's never done this before. We, we need to describe that for other participating subcommittee members. Then the next thing we do, this is some of the fun stuff. You start learning about the site. Usually we'll do a site visit. We may not be able to do that with some of our projects because of COVID. You, you look at all the site plans. You talk to the architect. Often you'll um, have the architect visit or participate, and the architect or landscape architect will give you the rundown of the design. So like for the Colton building, we will have the architect show us the building and all the uses that they designed. The next thing is we would review examples of similar projects. So. If you said, Dina, we want to see 10 projects that were at um, rec centers, then I will go research public art and design at rec centers and show them to the group to see what other people do. I also show budget options because sometimes people say we want this big massive thing, but our budget will only allow for a painting on the wall. So I do um, research examples of other projects to show the group. Then that's then the visioning starts. So the visioning is when you start establishing the criteria. In your guys's case, you as the CAPS group will have information to give the subcommittee to consider. So in your instance, you would um, review um, whatever direction comes from CAPS. Then the subcommittee needs to decide the placement of the artwork within the site, the design criteria, and the selection method. And so these three things that are underlined, we actually have listed in your handbook that you approved last week. So let me open those because um, uh, it doesn't look like my links are working that I made for myself. So hold on, give me one second and I'm gonna open that. Okay, so the first thing on the list is placement. So you guys have in your handbook site selection criteria. So the committee needs to review this criteria that you guys approved. For example, just for example, the site's on the criteria, the site has to be owned by the town. Okay, we may have some issues at the trailhead. Boulder County Open Space owns a lot of the site. So those are the details we have to get through. 
the site must be visible and accessible, so on and so forth. So you guys have certain criteria that the subcommittee needs to review when deciding the placement of the artwork. The next criteria to decide is the design criteria. And again, you have that listed in your handbook. And here's, here it is in the handbook. Art and design criteria. The following criteria shall be used in selecting works of art. Now, I haven't changed this yet. It should be art and design. So again, just bear with me. When I say art, I mean art or design. Artistic merit, high quality, unique. Compatibility with the site. Compliance with safety requirements. So you have this criteria that needs to be evaluated when you're picking the design of um, an artwork. And then all of these things too. So you guys have that established already. What is the design criteria? Now the group might say, um, we would like to have a metal sculpture that's 10 feet tall. That is design criteria. The group might say, okay, the Colton building, we're going to have a mural. So we know the mural is going to be 10 feet tall along this wall. So that's the design criteria as well. So you have some established design criteria, but then you have project specific design criteria. So the group needs to decide those things. And then the group needs to decide the selection method. And again, you have that listed in your handbook. And let me open that. Selection methods include the open competition, the invitational, the open invitational, artist roster, curator. So you guys have certain things in your handbook that you've already listed as the selection method. So the subcommittee will decide the selection method. Um, whoops. So that's placement, design criteria, and selection method. So these are just agenda items that we need to get through, right? Um, the last thing is eligibility. You all might decide for a project that's $5,000, you only want to do regional artists or designers. You might want to decide if it's a $150,000 project, you want to do a national search. So that's what eligibility means. So the subcommittee would decide all of these things and um, that results in this last bullet point. That results in the project implementation plan. And you guys may remember, we have done two project implementation plans together, one for the bus shelter and one for the prairie dogs. And that's what outlines all the criteria for a project. So then I take the project implementation plan and I prepare the RFP or the RFQ. I field all the inquiries from potential applicants. And then I receive and I prepare all the applications for review. So this is this yellow orangish circle is definitely everything that staff has to do. Now, if there's anyone who wants to volunteer and help me do any of that stuff, believe me, I will take your help. This is where we need to decide who's doing what. And I'm open for ideas or questions. Well, I definitely think we need support when it comes to gathering documents and information about the site. Mm -hmm. Every, everything else just seems like it's a conversation and an agenda item for the meeting, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, so for if, example. If this, is, if this is the first meeting, for example, for the trailhead, then um, yeah, it seems like it flows in a practical way, but I see where, where does the chair come in in the committee versus you, the town staff person? Well, and that's what's up to you guys. So okay. Claire for the trailhead is suggesting that she run the meeting 
and facilitate all of this as well as vote. So those are, it's complicated to facilitate a discussion and be part of it. But if you think you can do that and you want to do that, by all means, it's up to you guys. Um, I may not need to come to the meeting. You know, that's where I can be as hands off of you guys as you guys want me to. If, if the chair is going to do all of this, there might not be any reason for Dina to be at this meeting. Although if you're, if you're tying in OSAC, then the staff person might have a better idea of kind of what OSAC has been talking about because you would be talking to, um, you know, the OSAC liaison. So you kind of have an idea, oh, they were thinking they were going to put the sculpture somewhere else, for instance. So if you're at that meeting, then you're able to kind of give some historical perspective on it and, and what they're doing with it. Um, and, and you mentioned that, for instance, the trailhead, it can be done one way, but then what happens in October when we really are working as a whole committee on the art and mobility path? I mean, do we have a separate committee, I'm assuming, for art and mobility path? And then we're going to have to have yeah. those meetings starting in October with ProStack, OSAC, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and at right. that meeting, like if if when Claire does a trailhead, she's choosing to chair it and she will run the meeting and tap in to the staff resources and, and help with the inquiries and that kind of stuff. But then when we get to a different committee, it may be a different structure. And it's okay to do that or is that just going to make it really confusing? I mean, I know it will make it more confusing, but how to structure it going forward. Terry or David, do you have thoughts? Or Rachel? I see Rachel's there. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, I was late. My camera is going off and on, so it's off right now. But um, I'm just following along, trying to catch up. The only Terry, thing I was taking... wanted to say, I know that there's a lot of, um, it's going to be difficult, but um, you know, it, it seems like you're, you're, you're saying that it's going to be a really difficult thing. So should you be involved um, as sort of the facilitator? Is that the way you're wanting us to lean? I want you to lean whichever way you want. Um, I see Melinda, Melinda raise your hand. I'll get to you in just a second, Melinda. Um, as a staff person who's done this a handful of times, I can do as much or as little as you want. So, like I said, I can be totally hands off and let you guys just show up after all the subcommittee meetings and say we want these three artists to do proposals. Or I can come to every meeting and be advisory. I could come, you know, and like say, for example, let's say at the Colton building first meeting, you all say, we'd like to have a big three-dimensional sculpture installed to, on the side of the building. Like if you start going down that path and we haven't gotten like other input from other um, staff, that might be um, a challenge. And so I could say that sitting there in that meeting, oh, well, if you want to do a three-dimensional sculpture on the outside of the building, we have to go talk to A, B, and C person. So, you know, having me there is handy for a lot of reasons, but I'm also, I don't have to be there either. So. I mean, I think that I don't want to put any more on your plate, but you, you do, you are sort of the expert on this. Mm -hmm. It would be great to have you in that position. <laughs> yeah, take advantage of our knowledge. Right. Well, and again, like you're talking about a 3D sculpture on the outside of the Colton building. Well, when you're looking at that site review, and if we can't even do something like that, the the staff person would say to us, no, we can't, you, you can't do that. Or Boulder County Open Space comes in at the trailhead and says, no, we own that, you can't do that. Um, however that works, you, you would need to have the staff person, you, 
I would think at least in all the meetings. I mean, just as a minimum. And, and depending on the comfort level of the chair, then there would be maybe a slight difference in how it was handled trailhead versus um, temporary art, I think is almost a little bit more collaborative and it sounds like it just almost more discussion type things going on. Whereas the trailhead, because you're collaborating with another committee, I think those guidelines need to be a little bit, a little bit stricter. And OSAC may come in and say, no, we don't, we don't want the art here. We would like it here. Um, same thing with the art path. ProStack is gonna be uh, really involved with the art and mobility path. So I think that, that that staff person needs to be at least in every meeting kind of catching us when, you know, things come up basically. Yeah, Rachel, Melinda, do you have any thoughts on that too? We lost Melinda. She was there for a minute and I just texted her and said I lost her. So hopefully she'll okay. come back. Yeah, Rachel, any thoughts on that? No, I, I do think it would be helpful to have, um, Dean, I think it would be helpful to have you in the committees, so, or in the subcommittees. Well, and none of us have never, I mean, other than going through the triptych, we have never done any of this process before. So we really, we need that person guiding us, um, and, you know, especially till, again, the boat is built and we have an idea of what we're doing with it. Otherwise, we're just going to be spinning our wheels and it's going to make it way too difficult. So on the meeting too, Dina. Yeah, do you want to go through this kind of, again, this is just a typical meeting. We don't have to do it this way, but I do recall Debbie telling me that when you guys did the roundabout project, you had maybe 12 meetings or something oh really gosh, long and drawn out. Well, there, and I'll there tell were you, my, my yeah, there were hundreds of applications to get through. Yeah. yeah, my my typical meeting um, process for um, 150 applications is four meetings. So, um, with that being said, there's a lo there's a lot of different ways you can do stuff. But um, okay, so meeting two would be for the group to remind themselves about the criteria developed from meeting one. Um, we review in detail the conflict of interest statement because I don't want anyone voting on purchasing of goods and services if they have a conflict. Then the main part of the meeting is reviewing the applications. And so I have a certain voting process I used. Again, you guys do not have to use it, um, but a typical um, public art design selection process, you go through one, two, three, four voting rounds. And so um, these are very facilitated voting rounds. And what I wanted to show you with this link just really quick is an example ballot. So um, this is from a project I did in Commerce City where here are the applicants for the project. We're reviewing their resumes and their images of their past work. There's three voting rounds, one, two, three. And I go through this facilitated process where we are voting people in and out at each round. And then by the end, with any luck, you have maybe five that have risen to the top. Now this project, I only had 11 applicants. Um, but I've had projects where there's been 150 applicants before. And we go through those suckers fast. Believe me, we get, <laughs> I, we get to work. So there's, I would say half of the applicants of that number of applications, they don't even qualify. So you can get through them very quickly. Um, so that was just an example ballot that we would hand out. Um, we go through four voting rounds and then usually the very last voting round you can rank your top choices. So let's say there's four or five that rise to the top, then the committee ranks their top choices and we try to do a consensus on who the finalists, semi-finalists are to invite to create proposals. And so in CAPS's case, this committee in the second meeting will select perhaps three, I don't know what the exact number is, 
but maybe it's three semifinalists who will do a proposal. Now, if you're doing a direct purchase for an artwork that's already available, it's a little bit of a different process. So this, these two meetings are for site-specific commissions of artwork that have not been made yet. So I didn't want to go through details of all the selection methods, but there would be different things you do in each meeting depending on which selection method you choose. Okay, I, I, I was going to ask that question. Yeah, so if okay. you're doing an open competition for a site-specific artwork to be designed and built just for that place, then you would do um, this process and ask for proposals. If and that, you were going was to that do, triptych? was that what we did for triptych? No, the triptych you asked for proposals with the application, and that's not ter that's not very recommended for that budget size. So What's for a budget, budget of the hundred, small. It was too. It's a little bit too big. Usually, um, usually um, you would do a request for qualifications review their qualifications, and then select semifinalists to pay to give proposals. And I think you guys asked for proposals with their applications. How did this process apply to the temporary art? Is it under the budget limit, or is this something you're going to need to get proposals for those projects? Um, the temporary projects were what you might call invitation. So we targeted, for example, for the photography project for the portraits, we targeted only superior photographers. So that was an invitational. For the um, big, massive, like maybe blow up sculpture or the kites, that's also an invitational. So we know which artist does kites that we've asked them for. Um, a specific like idea or or proposal for doing a kite installation and that's called an invitational okay so if you have a if you know a real specific idea of what you want you can do an invitational rather than putting out an RFP and and soliciting applications right now um, it still has to be competitive so you have to have a few artists who are interested um, competitive if it's over two thousand dollars. So the kite thing is going to be maybe a thousand, maybe a little more. So we don't have to do three kite artists and see what their proposals are. Right. Okay, we, so we just know the, the guy from Boulder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But whereas the trailhead, because the budget on that is thirty thousand, kind of a different process. Yeah. Yeah. So then, just to um, finish up this, this meeting too here, so then what would happen is staff would handle the rest of the process, notify the applicants who was selected, talk to the people who were selected to do a proposal, and give them direction from the meeting. So for example, you might pick three artists and one of them you like them because they used a certain material a certain way. So I would tell that artist, we liked the um, image you showed of the sculpture at the rec center and we would like you to design something similar to that. So each artist has their own design direction from the committee. And I would convey that to the committee. Then I would also notify the applicants that were not selected and let them be easy. Um, then I would field inquiries for the artists who are developing proposals and I would oversee um, their design process and make sure they get all the information they need. Do they need site plans? Do they need to learn more about the history of the town? So that's where I would field inquiries and help them through their design process. Then once their proposals are ready, I receive the proposals and I prepare them for CAPS's review. So that's kind of a nutshell of what um, has happened previously in my previous projects for a typical selection process. So you get to the trailhead, for instance, then is there like a meeting number three or 
I, I see voting right there. So you're assuming you've done all this prep work between one and two. And mm -hmm. it sounds like that meeting two could take hours. Sometimes the meeting two possible? depends on how many applicants. I, usually if there's 20 or less applicants, we can get meeting two done in about two hours. If there's about 50 applicants, I usually push it to three hours. And if there's 150, 50, I do pre-screening before the meeting even starts and people vote online to cut out at least half. But we would so, still have the option again, to vote online, like with Triptych, for instance, going through those 120 different um, artists that submitted, um, and, and which is why it took us so long, because some were some were really strange, some were okay, others were fabulous. But we could do that online so we can see that ahead of time. So, yes. okay. So, whenever there's more than about 50 applications, I always recommend you do pre screening, is what we call it. You all sit at your own computer at your own house. You don't talk to anybody else. You don't let anyone help you vote. But you then go through and you say yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, maybe for 150 applications. And then when we get to the meeting together, we've cut out all the no's that you all already agree on. Then at the meeting, you guys are reviewing the yes and the maybes. And that probably usually gets you down to about 50. So you can go from 150 to 50 before the first subcommittee meeting even gets together to review the applications. Claire and Terry, since you went through it on the triptych, any thoughts on that? Um, or you know, the ability to do it online, for instance? Yeah, I think that that sounds great. I don't, I don't see any problems with that. No, I agree. I do, I do remember when we were doing triptych, we basically couldn't talk anyway. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the rule was we would vote route. and we couldn't talk. Yeah, we, we couldn't discuss, we just literally voted. So you could do that online to eliminate the ones that we didn't like and then meet and discuss the ones we liked just so we know we were having input on it. Yeah, I remember thinking that it would have been nice to see everything all at once because you kind of forget, you know, when you're just seeing them one at a time, you know, like it's nice to have a way to compare them. So maybe you could, maybe that would be easier online. Yeah, and that's what the um, callforentry.org website's great for. I don't know what service you guys used. Did you use a service? No, I don't know. Not oh. that I really so no. when you have a big call for entry where you think you're going to get more than 20 or 25 entries, it's best to use an online service. And then you all log in by yourselves at your house and you do the pre-screening. Okay. So um, that's usually projects that are big dollar amounts. Um, I don't know, this $30,000 trailhead might, you can get more than 20 applications easy. For that if you were to do a site specific commission i would think designed. so especially the location yeah yeah i mean thirty thousand is a big deal right now people are going to want to apply for a thirty thousand dollar project so um so and then maybe i can just round out oh go ahead well okay so the this is what you look at as being somewhat of a traditional selection process you have used that, um, we can discuss it, you know, as, as a group. Um, can you do like a brief review of another way of doing it or is it something that we shouldn't even think about? Um, I mean, well, this is, this is totally fine with me and it looks like it goes with all the guidelines. Um, maybe we should go around and everybody gives an opinion right. on is, is this a setup for the, the meeting one and meeting two that everybody's okay with? And really that biggest responsibility is going to be on the trailhead because that's the first biggie that's coming up. So I'm, I'm perfectly fine with, and this makes total sense to me, but how about if we go around and kind of get a consensus or a thought where you stand on it? Terry, you went through triptych, any thoughts, ideas? No, I'm, I'm, uh, well, the triptych was kind of overwhelming. And I think this process um, seems to be a lot easier. 
And so I have no problems with this, but I'm not the chair of the subcommittee, Claire is. And so I'm willing to go with whatever, but I, I like the way Dina has set this up. Okay, Claire, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I like that it's just two meetings. I don't think that there are any surprises, really. I don't think there's anything really controversial. I think, I think that'll work really well. I think really the only thing um, that maybe needs to be determined is, um, you know, who is presiding over the meetings and who's running through the agenda and creating the agenda. And that might be something that changes by subcommittee. I, I don't see a problem with having flexibility there because different people are going to be chairing different subcommittees and they might have different comfort levels with that. So, but I do yeah. agree it's important to have Dina there that she knows she's there to be a support to us. And so I think it's important to, to have her there to provide that support. I also think that in those two little yellow ovals, by the way, then she is handling all the relationships with the artist. So that yeah. doesn't get muddled. Right. Um, I think that got sometimes a little muddled with a triptych. Whereas if Dina as that um, staff liaison person is really handling all this, I think it might make that a little bit clearer. Um, And Rachel, any thoughts? Where, and I, I just want to thank Melinda on one part. Oh, oh, Melinda? Sorry, I just want to tell you Melinda's on now. Okay, because Melinda went through the triptych, so she might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, um, how about who, maybe David or Rachel, since they heard um, kind of the conversation, and I'll unmute, I'll unmute uh, Melinda. Yeah, I think this process looks really good. I think it would be really important to have you there, Dina. And I um, also like the idea of having some flexibility between the subcommittees, depending on where people are at. Yeah, I would agree. I, it, it'd be, I, I think, you know, the two meeting deal is, seems, seems nice. And this is a very concise outline. I'm um, having Dina there would be great. And, um, yeah, again, defer, I, I think I agree with what Claire was saying too on, on all respects. And if you're comfortable with running things, um, then that's great too. <laughs> but I do think there's a value for Dina to be there. Can you hear me? There's Melinda. Can you finally hear me? I've been, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here a long time. So um, I heard everything. I love this idea. I think where we got into big trouble when we were doing the triptych is that we were trying to create our own system and then it got muddled when we had to go back and try to review their current um, mm -hmm. their existing works of art right so then we ended up kind of going backwards but with this process like i, I actually think that, that we wouldn't have even chosen the triptychs had we not gone back to look like their previous works of art right that was like right. That was like an epiphany yes. we had like way yes. too late in the process. So this actually we're, it gives us the opportunity to kind of review their previous work like before we even get into it. So I think this is great. So I think this eliminates all of the hassles that we had. So um, I, I'm really excited about this. Yeah, no. And if, can that be done on like some way online access? Because when we were doing the triptych, remember, Oh my gosh, we had all these files. There was like 120 file folders. So every time we wanted to look at something, we had to pull out the actual physical file folder and go back and go, oh, remember this one? So if there's some way that that can be, that would be a huge help that it, it, it really um, speeds that process up so much. Because I mean, I don't remember how many meetings we have, but it was, it was eight or I mean, it was a lot of meetings where we just sat there and went through everything. So oh, this... there were riots. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will promise you we will not have riots in our meetings. Okay. If I can help it, there will not be riots. <laughs> okay. So, so just is that facilitated in a better way through that online program yeah. that you're talking about, Dina? Sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. So all of our call for entries that I think we'll have, um, and I mean call for entries, meaning requests for qualifications or proposals. Um, if I think that there's going to be more than like 20 applications, we're doing it online because 
it is too hard to process applications that are hard copy. Um, the Prairie Dog is just about as much as I can handle using um, Dropbox. So it's um, there. It's like four hundred dollars to get the online service. It's very inexpensive considering the service um, that's available. Uh, and you know what it does for you. Is that guess what by I'm getting project at. or is that? by annually it depends like if you're just doing one project in a year it's going to be about four hundred dollars but if you, you can buy a package so if we know we're doing four for the year you get a discount so um that'll come out of the project budget okay so um let's see was to, there anyone else who had more comments So now with this format, um, the only thing that is a little bit flexible or um, may change due to the project is roles and responsibilities. Otherwise, um, everything looks pretty standard for every other art selection process. Do we need to vote on this, Dina, or can we just do a, a you know consensus agreement on it? How does that work? Um, I think that um, I had intended that you guys could vote if you needed to, um, because all seven of you were going to be here, but Christina is not here, but a majority of you are. So um, I know that Karen is always very um, particular that voting has to happen at regular meetings, but okay. I talked to Leslie today and she said, since all of you or majority of you would be on this line um, talking about this and it's a pretty important process to talk about and especially with the timing of the trailhead committee um, that if you felt like you needed to vote or kind of call a consensus vote then you could do that today okay i i think to get this up and running we just call for a consensus vote is that okay with everybody yeah claire yeah. since you're the since yeah. you're the first um feet to the fire Mm -hmm. Why don't we start with you? Because you're the one who's going to be starting the trailhead committee. Okay, do you want me to call for the vote or do you want me to vote? Either way. Okay, Okay. so I, I propose that we adopt the, this um, selection process. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can you see me? Melinda Aye. says yes. Rachel said yes. Yeah, Melinda said, yeah, Debbie says yes. And, and I think the next the next part of that is um, that you guys are willing to let the chair um, create the agendas and run the meeting. Is yeah, that I think what I understood? That's I think that's what a chair is. So, right. Okay. So Claire, then for the trailhead committee, you'll be developing the agenda. And um, you can just turn to me when you need help. Okay. And is all of this information in the public art management handbook or should I, uh, do I need a copy of all of this? This slide is not. So that, that was why we needed to have this talk today because we'd never gone through this. So this I can email to the group and put in our Dropbox. Okay. And then also I'm happy to put in some sample meeting agendas that I've used for other projects. Oh, that'd be great. Um, let, me, let me just show you one thing really quick. So this is the one I used for um, Commerce City. And um, they had, you know, particular needs. So usually the first thing is we do introductions. Everybody says who they are. I usually do a, what do you call it? Um, icebreaker? What do you call it? An icebreaker. <laughs> Thank you. Something fun. Um, Often when I was a consultant, anyhow, working with art selection committees that never did any projects before, um, we would talk about what is public art? Why do communities have public art? Um, so this agenda is specific to the project that I did, but you can pick and choose what you want to put on here. I would always talk about the public art program as, as an educational tool for the people in the room. We don't have to do that here. 
Uh, we always talk about the process and whose roles and responsibilities are what. Um, for this project, we talked about the budget. We talked about the construction project because it was new construction. We talked about the timeline. Um, so I can give you just a few um, sample agendas um, and put in the Dropbox or um, email as well. I can do both. I would say as many to places develop that for can, any, as many places as you can put it so we know where to find it would be great. Okay. And then um, the, the last slide I did, which we don't even have to go over, you guys already know, this is what happens after all this stuff happens, is the CAPS process. You guys review the HOPE committee meeting notes, you review the proposals, you evaluate your proposals based on the criteria in the handbook, you have discussion, public comment, vote, and then it goes to the board. So that was just the last slide of my thing I was going to show you, but we don't have to go into that into detail because you've already done that part before. But you will post that somewhere we can, you know, any, yeah. any committee member can go back and look at this and say, remember we talked about that. Yep. Um, and so the only time it goes to the Board of Trustees is if the budget is over 25000 Equal to or over, yeah. Okay, there's not a certain, you know, a certain situation where the Board of Trustees says, wow, you know, this might be, well, like for instance on the trailhead, they're going to have to vote on that because the budget is 30000 Um, Does it come up that maybe the budget's only 20000 but the Board of Trustees have strong feelings that they want to see and be able to give final approval. Does that ever happen? What, what does that look like? We will find out. We have suggested in your public art plan uh, management handbook that you guys sent to them that the approval process only goes to the board if it's $25,000 or more. So we will just have to see if that really happens. Okay, so it's, in that case, it's really a dollar decision. Yep, because that's what other goods and services um, uh, amount is for the town in general. So I made the argument to leadership, um, the manager and the director, that why would we do a different process for art and design than any other contract with the city, with the town, I mean. So I did get it through, but we'll just have to see how things go as we move along to our next projects. Okay. Um, the one thing we didn't really review and talk about um, is then this reviewing applications. Um, so the, um, the next part really is this voting is um, really facilitated. So you guys, maybe at, maybe at the next CAPS meeting or something, we can talk about this um, process once you have applications how that works and then who's facilitating the voting. Again, like this first meeting agenda, it sounds like um, for the trailhead, at least um, Claire is going to lead this meeting and, and do this agenda. This is a, this is a different um, method than the first meeting. So um, do you want to talk about that now or put that on uh, the agenda for the June meeting? Um, I mean, I would just, I think it makes more sense. I think you're right. If everyone on the subcommittee is voting to have a third party who's facilitating that voting, I think that makes more sense in that meeting. I agree. I think it makes it more objective. I think it gives a little bit of distance between the committee member and what's going on. So then, you know, the staff liaison person would facilitate that process of, of voting. And Claire and Rachel, uh, Christine is not here, but it'd be similar to what we did in the bus shelter, where we had the voting round yeah. and we had, um, I was taking notes while you guys were discussing and I was, you know, trying to um, remind you of, of things that had been said five minutes before and, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to keep, keep the conversation going. Um, well, uh, just, taking keeping track of what's being said and and where you're at for timeline and stuff like that and that okay, works so that we agree great. on that all of us agree on that yeah and that voting have a the staff is on facilitating now do you know when it comes to like the prairie dogs for instance let's say we get hopefully 14 15 20 
different designs. Um, do we do the same process under the voting over here? How's that going to work? Um, let's say if we get, um, let's say if we get 15 designs and you need to pick 12, that's going to be a real easy conversation. I don't think there needs to be voting rounds for that necessarily. But okay. when you start getting into to 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 applications, that's when you really need to start doing the voting rounds. Because what you're trying to do is narrow, narrow, narrow to the top cream of the crop. Right. If you're if you're trying to get from 150 applications to one artist, there has to be a real facilitated um, narrowing process. And that's what the voting rounds are for. Okay. Anything else that we need to decide or cover at this point in time? I'm comfortable and um, I'm available to, you know, move forward with how you guys suggested and um, excited to pick some art, help you pick some art. Because I don't so pick Claire, it. Just remember, Claire, I don't vote. So. Claire, do you have that list of the seven people on the Trailhead Committee and do you have any idea when you're meeting or? Yes. Um, yeah, I surveyed everybody and we're going to be meeting Tuesday early evening. So I think it sounds like we might need some background information on the site before that time. Mm -hmm. I thought Leslie was yeah, going to get I'll make sure to get that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure to have that for the meeting. And then um, just let me know what else you need before Tuesday, Claire. Okay. And Claire, who's on the CAPS committee for that? Terry, David, Melinda, and myself. Okay, great. All right, anyone um, have any other thoughts or questions before we close? I don't. No. I'm good, thank you. Melinda? All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too.